What's up, Jake? Jeff in Las Vegas. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing good. Uh, I loved your film, man. It was excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. You know, after America, a group of, I'm trying to understand this, a group of mm -hmm. criminal justice workers, de-escalation de workers in Minneapolis. And this is a mixed blend of a documentary with stage scenes. It's really messed with my mind. Because I'm yeah, just it, like, it, it's very confusing to people yeah. whether it's what genre it falls into, which has been uh, something I've discovered along the way. Um, but I think it gets to kind of the reason I made the film in a way, because um, part of the really inspiration of the film was I was working out in Los Angeles and I was looking around and I was like, wait, it feels like we're making movies in the 1930s. Like, why are we still making movies this way? <laughs> like, We don't have giant 30 millimeter cameras anymore. And like, we don't need a studio film. Like all those lights existed because you needed to get the film negative to have anything on it. Like, that's why it was that way. Those, you know, <laughs> 1930s, the guys who started, who financed those studios would not pay for a single light unless it was necessary. Um, and so why are we still making movies like this? And to be honest, like those old ways, those traditions were kind of exploitative. You know, th that era, the kind of foundation of that model was not a really great one when it came to workers' rights or anything like that. Um, or even just, you know, there's famous stories of to get a child actor to cry, they gave him a puppy and then killed the puppy. You know, it's like, there's some rough stuff that they were doing back then. And that so was, I was looking around and I was like- That was Jackie Cooper, by the way. That yes. Is Jack, yes. His, <laughs> Please, Mr. Don't Shoot My Dog was the name of this book, his autobiography. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I read that, yeah. Yeah, and there's a lot of books like that. It's not like it's a one-off. And I was looking around and I was like, this is kind of crazy. Like we've been in, you know, in the eighties and nineties, there was all this talk of the democratization of the technology. It hit, suddenly it was easier to make films unlike any other time in human history. And weirdly, the response was, we're gonna get even more conservative of how we make them. And so when I was looking around, I was like, what? what I don't see being prioritized is the actual human connection that we're trying to capture on screen. Everything seems to be trying to get in the way of that, like from a mark to a light to everything. It's like, we put all the emphasis on the technology and none on the actual human beings and us as a group coming together and making something. And so what I wanted to do was sort of like, just kind of reject everything I'd been taught, <laughs> everything I'd been trained in film school, everything I'd been taught in the industry. And I was like, I'm just gonna dive in and I'm gonna focus in on us as people and see where that leads us. So came, uh, I've been spending my time between LA and Minneapolis where I'm from and where I was born and raised. And I was like, I'm just gonna do an open call whoever wants to show up, I'll meet with them and we'll chat and we'll get to know each other. Um, instead of like a traditional audition, it was more kind of like this, just a conversation for like 15 or 20 minutes. And I met with about four or 500 people. And from that, I distilled it down to seven. Yeah, it was, it was a process. Other people. <laughs> yeah, I distilled it down to about seven. Um, and then from, and those seven were kind of a real variety of folks. So, um, there was, there's like Ahmed, who's originally from Somalia, who's a poet and playwright and educator. There's uh, Robert, who actually is from England, lived in Italy, Canada, ended up in the States. And he's a three-time Guinness Book World Record for bullwhipping. And he tours the country <laughs> doing rodeos and S&M conventions. Sure he and, does. <laughs> yeah. That's and awesome. then there was folks uh, who were born and raised in Twin yeah. City. Dan anyway. Fox, totally impressed me. Loved yeah. him. He's and also, wonderful. And Daniel was awesome too. Oh yeah. I love Daniel through the whole movie, so. And both of them, like Daniel was a, is a fine too. He came in, he's just a sweet guy. He's as sweet in person, or even sweeter in person than he seems in the film. But he's a fairly sweet guy. He's an actual pizza delivery guy in real life. He just is like, wanted to do stuff, wants, you know, is getting into acting, getting into trying things really open. And then um, Yvonne and Teresa work part of their job, of the jobs they have, because they have a few, as many of us do these days, um, as criminal justice de-escalation workers. And so they go in and work with correctional officers and police officers and other folks involved in that industry and they do improv. Ooh. And they, and so that's kind of what, that kind of linked into these larger ideas I was interested in. And that's kind of what kicked off the film. Well, I'm not sure the word easier is the right word, but is, was it easier as a filmmaker, you know, to literally, you're just capturing the moment and the movie was fully improvised. So mm -hmm. for you, like you said earlier, you know, with all the big lights and all the crew and all that. So essentially, you know, you did everything. You wrote, produced, you know, edited everything. So did it make your job easier, you know, more exciting just to point and shoot? Yeah, actually, in a lot of ways, it was nice to, 
you know, because I've been working on a lot of union stuff, which is great. And I'm very pro union and, it, you know, it's wonderful. Uh, but as a director, once you get on set of a union shoot, you kind of just sit there for hours yeah. and occasionally you get up and you actually then have like 15 minutes of talking to another human being and being like, okay, you know, let's talk about what you're feeling and what's going on in the scene. And now I'll sit or, down or, and we'll hurry, up, or hurry up and wait, you know? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah. So you so, just do that and you're, and so you got a lot of time to think, which is maybe part of why I was like, why are we making movies like this? Where this, it kind of felt like it touched on when you're like a kid with a camera again. And you're just doing it and the possibilities are limitless and you never and there's at least for me there's this real joy of like i don't know what we're going to discover i don't know what's going to happen like if um actors cried or discovered something or something wild happened in a scene there was very little i knew would do it like maybe there's one or if sometimes it was sort of like situational improv where i knew like okay this person you're coming in from this or you're gonna like i knew what like in the, the first photography scene with um, Dan Fox, like I knew what the props were the photographer had. Like right. I had like some understanding, but other than that, we just kind of went and so, saw and it felt, you were kind of felt like you were shooting reality TV or a documentary. So essentially way. you didn't say no to anything. You just kind of let the actors yeah. do what they wanted to do. And uh, well, you know, that was like, uh, I love your rave ending too, you know, the dance club, <laughs> you know, yeah. the W. I just thought that was, you know, cause the movie's kind of heavy, you know, the yeah. movie's kind of, you know, dealing with emotions and, you know, some taboo subjects and stuff like that. And at the end, I just love dancing in the snow and the shower. Going, I was just like, you know, okay. You know, you left it on a high note, which I liked. You kind of gave me a breather. Oh, thanks. Yeah. 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 And I think that was kind of, I mean, it was all sort of on instinct too. So even like the ending and all of that, I was just sort of like, well, what, you know, the film, ultimately what we kind of were, just what the sort of began in the workshopping and the jumping out was sort of how do we let everything that's churning in us out? How do we how do we use this process, this one project we're doing together as a group of people for you know what ended up being like two and a half, three months from the workshopping to the shooting? How can we use this to better ourselves, to actually get to know each other, to actually let stuff out in a way that's healthy? Um, and I used what I like to call the Smokey the Bear rule, where you kind of you're supposed to leave your campfire better than you found it. I had my Smokey the Bear rule, you leave your collaborators better than you found them. And the idea was like, how do we use this opportunity of making this project to kind of have a catharsis and let stuff out? And so for the ending, I was sort of like, how do I, I guess in a way kind of communicate that experience when things do come out, when there is a rush of emotion? But this um, is only part two, right? I mean, you this is a trilogy, right? So is, yeah. is this a third installment underway? Do you have an idea for it or? I, I have no idea. I mean, I have an idea of what the topic, what will kind of kick it off because the three films are in some way, I think I was sort of inspired by um, Krzysztof Kieslowski, the Polish director who did the Three Colors trilogy. And he looked at the three colors of the French flag and made a film that was based on what they each stand for. Hmm. And so I, when I made the first film of this trilogy open, I was like, you know, I'm kind of interested. It was at that point, I started it in 2005. So it was right after the new millennium. And at that point, there was this kind of idea like, oh, we're a new millennium, you know, Y2K, all this, but nothing really felt like it changed. You know, it, it took a little while for things to really feel like the 20th century was different than the 21st, but I knew everything was changing. We just didn't see it yet in a big way, but things were shifting if you kind of like got boots on the ground and looked around. And so I was interested in looking at kind of these three big American, you know, the unalienable rights, these things we like to talk about a lot, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And, you know, they, we, they're these, you know, supposedly big ideology foundations of our lives in America, but what do they really mean to us? You know, they're just, they're almost like buzzwords at this point. And so the first film open looked at life and I was interested, like, can you actually live as you are, as who you are in America? And this film, I was interested in looking at the idea of liberty which, you know, freedom is a, another buzzword we throw around like crazy in the country. But I was like, can you actually be free? Like, can you be free of what you struggle against in America? Can you be free of America if you wanted to? Like, what can you become free? And what does that mean? Not in a big, you know, sp plastered across a, you know, a helicarrier, yeah. but in your personal life. And, and so the next one will be about happiness. 
and yeah, food for thought because uh, you know of all days the Trump's impeachment trial starting today. You know, can yeah. you be really free? You know, so <laughs> yeah. and tell me about taking it to Slam Dance, being accepted to that. How's that feel? Oh, it's great. You know, I've been a big fan of Slam Dance for a long time. I really am sort of a kindred spirit of their ethos of continuing to be a place for really independent filmmakers with really unique voices to be seen and to be to have their work presented and to kind of be championed by other filmmakers. And I think, you know, for those of us who've been around for a little bit longer, we remember we what happened when streaming showed up. You know, it wiped out decades of infrastructure to see and discover independent filmmaking voices and world cinema voices that, you know, the the video stores were probably it's Halicon era when you could wander in and just, just find stuff you never would have discovered otherwise. Things you I never owned, even knew. You I owned five from. video stores. Oh, bless your when heart. I, when <laughs> I graduated from high school, I became an entrepreneur in 1985, opened one store and had five. And in 1991, UNLV, where I live in Las Vegas, started their four-year film program. So I sold the stores and went to film school. Wow. You know, yeah, so it was just, but, you know, I just like, I remember having all the stores and I used to play a game. You could tell me the name of a title. I would know the studio, you know, because you just, you learned everything, but you're right. I got to watch films that were beyond the, you know, the big theatrical, big blockbusters. There were so many interesting uh, uh, video companies that put out these kind of films, you know, that, that you never, never would have discovered. Never, that. absolutely not. Yeah. And now, you know, with streaming though, now it's like on demand. It's just like, it's some of these like, these film festivals, I think they're going to start switching, giving people the opportunity not only to go to Slam Dance or Sundance, but now with the success, you see how many people went to Sundance? Like to, yep. you know, I think they need to do a component now where more people can be involved watching these from from home. You know, yeah. not everyone can go to Park City. I only started going to Sundance five years ago, and there was a Slam Dance office right next door. I mean, I would, and they were just so much more accommodating. I just love Slam Dance. I really do. So your film was like perfect for that for for this uh, program for Slam Dance this year. Yeah, no, it's it's been really lovely too, because like like you're saying, although they're broadening, um, a lot of those festivals that started in the '80s, '90s to really showcase stuff, you know, they've we've been talking for years that they've become more and more kind of connected or branches of an industry, and less of discovery. And but right. someone like Slam Dance, it's great that there's still kind of the rabble rousers out there, asking the hard questions, pushing stuff. You know, I don't think there can I always think it's important that any sort of um, cultural world or community, the establishment and the ones questioning the establishment and that dialogue between the two is what gives you a healthy culture. And I think Slam Dance's position in pushing things and asking those hard questions and kind of allowing the sort of um, really kind of innovative and different ways of making films and different voices to have a platform is so vital and important. And so well, it's a real honor to be part of it. Well, you're after America is right where it belongs. So Jake, thanks for talking to me today, man. I loved your film and uh, you. I can't wait to watch the third installment. We'll talk again soon, okay? Yeah, thanks again.